Welcome to another Bandology interview. Bandology is a Canadian nonprofit dedicated to more music for more kids via education, collaboration, and community. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Bandology interview, and I am Ryan McKinnon. And this is our special guest today, Dan Austin. Hey, thanks for having me. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Thank you so much for asking me to be here. And I'm a big fan of what Bandology does. I think you guys are awesome. Yeah, for sure. We're excited to have you here. Um, Can you just to start off, describe a little bit about what you currently do? Yeah. Um, So I am currently the instrumental music teacher and band director at GCVI in Guelph. I've been here for 11 years now. I've taught music for 21. Um, uh, At the school right now, I teach all of our grade nine through 12 instrumental classes. And I also run our senior wind ensemble, junior wind ensemble, marching band and drum line, stage band and string. We have a chamber string group here at the school as well. Um, We are an international baccalaureate school. So we do teach the IB music program as well. Um, And we have also uh, a full vocal guitar and music theater program taught by my colleague Lane Osborne so that's what I've been up to for the last uh last 11 years or so wow that's crazy you have a string ensemble we do uh it it actually started it was sort of I I had a really really strong string player uh, a girl by the name of Bridget Walsh and Bridget um is just an incredible player played with the Vancouver Symphony when she was like a kid, like she she got into their program and stuff. Um, and so we started talking about doing pieces with strings and we started. I started to realize that there was a whole lot of students at my school who were part of the Guelph Suzuki School who had trained in string. And I said, well, why don't we put together an ensemble? And Bridget actually ran it for the first couple of years as a student run thing. And then um, even last year, because I couldn't direct it, a student, named Gabby Rubinoff ran it so it was a new wrinkle we added in the last couple years but they're fantastic I mean they went to nationals and won two gold medals in the last couple years so they they're they're doing great and they sound awesome it's a new adventure for me I'm not although I'm a a double bass player I'm a jazz player I have no training in orchestra (laughs) at all so it was a really uh big learning curve to me and actually I should say shout out to Tony Luong who has been awesome he's helped me a lot uh, done some workshops with my kids and taught me a lot of things that I didn't know about strings. So yeah, it was a new thing we added a couple of years ago. Wow, that's crazy. And when I was in high school, we had like no string players at all. Like how many people are in this ensemble? Um, it's not huge. So I think we had about seven or eight the first year. So a couple cello, uh, I want to say three cellos, a couple violins. Um, and then last year, I think I think we had six uh, with just one cello and the rest were all uh, violin players. So we take chamber music and sort of rearrange it a bit. Um, so, you know, there, there is music written for just the cello um, and violin, but it's harder to find. So sometimes we'll take a viola part, turn it into a third violin part, put a cello on one of the bass parts. So we kind of mess around with some of the arrangements to make it work. Um, right. Going into next year, I don't know. I, I know I have a couple cellos and a couple violins, but every year it's it's pretty small, less than 10. Wow. Very nice, for sure. Um, okay, well, the next question is, when did you first start playing? Okay, so um, my music background is a little bit unique. I started off as a vocalist. Um, I really did, like, my family's very musical. Uh, they're not musicians, but my mother plays piano very well. She has, like, her conservatory piano. Uh, They both sang in the church choir growing up. They still sing in a church choir. There was always music around in my house. So I first got into singing. I did a lot of music theater as a kid. And uh, at the age of 10, I came to my parents and said, I want to take singing lessons. You know, and that was weird. Like, this is the mid 80s. I grew up in Aurelia, which is like a small hockey town. And I said I wanted to take singing lessons. So I think I was probably one of the only males in town (laughs) taking singing lessons. And I trained in singing Um, until my voice changed. I trained with a woman named Elizabeth Martell. Then my voice changed. I got into, became an operatic tenor, trained with a guy named Albert Greer, did music theater all through school. Uh, But it wasn't until high school that I actually got into an instrument. And I don't remember how or why, but I picked the bass, the electric bass, loved it. 
ended up switching to the double bass, getting more into jazz um, and doing that. And then my last year of high school, I took the extra year back when high school was five years. So I was in high school for six years. Uh, and that last year, I, I was only going to school part-time and taking private lessons on the bass so I could get into some good university programs. Um, I took an extra music credit uh, that my music teacher gave me as an independent study. And it was in a grade 10 class. And I learned to play every instrument. I switched instruments every two weeks. And that was awesome because then I had a little bit of a, a bass in each instrument. And that helped me out a lot when I decided to get into teaching um, that I was able to do that. But my playing and my training um, started as a vocalist when I was about 10 and went through till you know my early 20s. And then as an instrumentalist, didn't start till grade nine. That started when I was 14. And then obviously have been playing ever since. Um, but it was, it was great to have that opportunity to learn brass and woodwind instruments because now as a teacher, I have enough of a bass in each instrument that I can instruct on the basics. And then if it gets into more advanced stuff, I can call on people who are experts on those instruments. Wow, that's awesome. When you started playing double bass, did you ever do any like rock band stuff? I did. I had my own rock band in high school called Ashley Automatic. <laughs> wow. And nice. it was funny because like back in the 90s, um, there was lots of gigs. Like we were playing, again, I grew up in Aurelia. And for those of you who don't know, like Aurelia is like an hour north of Toronto, but it's called Cottage Country. And like in the summer, I played every Friday, Saturday night at a bar right on the water. Um, and even like I wasn't even of age. I was like 16 or 17. Then we would play Sundays on a patio of another place, like an acoustic set. We were playing three nights a week every week all summer and I thought oh this is what gig life is like <laughs> well it's not you know we we had a lot of success when I was really young um, and the double bass um, when I picked it up I, I kind of taught myself some basics um, there was a, a senior student at my school named Mike Lalonde who's actually still a professional bassist in Toronto um, and Mike showed me some of the basics on the instrument and I, I got okay at it and then that summer, I went to the National Music Camp of Canada, NMC. And that's where I met these two guys, a guy named Ross McIntyre and Michael Heron, who are insane bass players. And they were insane bass players as kids. Uh, and they're still, right now, like two of the top guys in the city of Toronto playing bass. Um, and I realized, holy crap, if I want to get good at this, I need to be as good as these guys. And they were both taking lessons with Pat Collins. So I started taking lessons with Pat. And I would drive to Toronto once a month from Aurelia and take a two-hour private lesson, which was a long lesson. Um, and we did a lot of playing, a lot of jamming. Uh, sometimes we'd take a coffee break just to listen to albums. And I learned a ton about that. So when you became a double bass player, you got a lot of work because there weren't very many people uh, on that instrument. But it took me a while to really master and learn. Like, it's, it's a demanding instrument. And I, I joke around, like, I say it's like the evil mistress because I don't play it very often, but when I do now and I get on it, I'm like, oh my gosh, my hands hurt. Yeah. Like if you don't pay attention to that instrument and play it regularly, you're going to know. So if I have like a gig coming up right now, especially after like this whole COVID break thing, I would have to spend a couple of weeks of serious practice to get my hands back into shape to be able to play a full gig. So, yeah. Yeah, I bet. Wow. That's awesome. Um, okay. Well, what sort of things do you do as an instrumental instructor? Just um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a lot. The, the school is unique. Um, so because GCBI is an IB school, an international baccalaureate school, we draw from a very large base of elementary schools. We have our five main feeder schools, but we also draw from all around the area. And some of the students coming in have played instruments before. So depending on the elementary school they went to, they could have played for two or three years with some really strong instructors who know a lot about music and then have other students who come in who, who haven't played at all. So I spend grade nine a lot of the time building fundamentals, teaching them the good practices of playing, how to create good tone, how to be consistent. We do a lot of playing of um, like corrals, long tone, scale exercises, things that are going to build them up so that they can start to get some command of the instrument. And then I find 
if a student chooses it in grade 10, they're usually going to stay in music the whole way. So once we get into grade 10, then we can start to dig in to some more technical elements of it. Um, and then in the senior grades, um, we start to get into composition. We start to talk about how do you create your own music? How do you improvise your own music? Um, and get into a lot of like, I, I often use the term with my students, you build your musical toolbox. So as you go, you're, you're getting more and more skills that then when you go to create and start to make your own music, you have those skills there. So I have always looked at music education as like a four year process. I don't think of it as like grade nine, grade. If, if a student's in for the whole four years, that's the whole process that by the end of it, I wanna make sure that they have developed you know, a, a love of music and understanding of the discipline and hopefully will keep music in their lives some point after they graduate. Um, but that's, ba that's, that's kind of how I design my music program around learning varieties of skills that then can be implemented into creating music in whatever way you choose. So if you become an improvised musician, if you get into a rock group, if you become a jazz musician, if you end up playing in a symphony, um, or even if you end up playing in a community band, like that sort of thing. I just want my students to stay involved in music somehow in their life. Wow, that's very cool. That's a, that does sound like a lot. <laughs> it, it is, but like, I've, I've been doing this for a while. I, you know, like I'm on the back end of my career I'm not <laughs> at this point, and I feel fairly comfortable with the, the kind of stuff that I've created. So um, it, it's a system that works for me and seems to work for my students. Right. Cool. Well, I know you've done this at like a bunch of different schools. You taught at like three or four different public schools, I think. Yeah. So like, did you enjoy that experience, like moving around to different schools? I, I did. I did. So especially at the beginning. Um, so I started my teaching career at Twin Lakes Secondary School in Aurelia, which was actually the high school I went to. Um, and that was just by coincidence. I came out of school as a music teacher was retiring and ended up getting into that job. Um, and those first three years were like a learning experience because it, 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 for any music teacher, what, <laughs> you learn a lot in teacher's college, you have your skills, but you have to learn through experience, right? Like I've, I've said this to so many um, music education students I've worked with. I've said like, look, you're gonna learn more the first one hour that you're in front of your own classroom than you're gonna learn all through teacher's college. Because once you're there and it's your room and you've got to run the show, you know, you, you start to figure out how it works. So um, those first three years were really good for me learning some of the basics, but you know, it was weird because I went, I was teaching at the high school I went to, I knew a lot about what had happened at that school. And I really wasn't doing my thing. I was kind of just doing what had already happened there. Um, and I ended up moving to Toronto just by coincidence because um, my girlfriend, who is now my wife, had finished her master's degree in the States and was coming back to Southern Ontario. And I wanted to be closer to where she was. So uh, that's when I moved to Glen Haven Middle School in Toronto. And that to me, um, was when I really started to learn how to teach. It was uh, a school that was grade six, seven, and eight. And it had like 550 students, like an insanely large number. So, you know, five or six classes per grade. And they all took music with me in a rotary system. I, it was funny, like I had a attendance book with the kids' pictures in it because I saw them so so seldom it was hard to know who the kids were after a while i'd have to look and go oh oh that's you okay you know so um but one of the advantages of that is that if i was teaching a lesson i teach it five or six times in a week so you know let's say i was teaching a, a lesson to the grade sevens on some basic tone development stuff i would teach it throughout the week five or six times and i kind of refine it every time i taught it and go okay well this worked with this group but didn't work with this group maybe i can do this better i spent too long on this and then so i did that job for three years and i walked out of that job going okay i think i know how to do this because i felt really comfortable now having done so many lessons over and over again developed a system that had really worked well um and i ended up leaving only because you know life took me that direction my wife um, got a job in Guelph and we moved to Guelph and I commuted for a year and I hated it 
uh, nothing against commuting people. I'm just not one of them. I, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. Um, it was about March of that year that I'm like, no, <laughs> I can't do this. So I started to look for work in Guelph and luckily found uh, a job teaching music at an elementary school, which was Mitchell Woods Public School. Always sort of wanting to get back into secondary, hoping to end my career teaching secondary school. Um, and then I had a great time at Mitchell Woods. Um, I taught grade four through grade eight music. Like that was young, grade four kids on band instruments, but it was super cool because nobody else was doing it at that time. Um, and we had a lot of fun with that program. And then I, I can remember the day that um, the, the, the big high school in downtown in Guelph, GCVI, was hosting a dodgeball tournament for the elementary school kids. So I, I was there as a uh, supervisor. And I, I thought, oh, I'm going to pop in the music room. I'm going to talk to the music teacher, say hi to them. So I, I pop in and I get in there and the music teacher, Allison, says to me, I'm retiring. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. So I said, so Heidi's taking over. She goes, no, Heidi's leaving. Heidi and her husband are moving to the States. I'm like, Re so like this job's open, like the head of music at this school is going to be open next year. And she's like, yeah. And I said, is this official? She's like, yeah, I, I, she says, well, you know, the principal knows. I'm like, okay. And I walked up to the principal's office. I knocked on his door and I'm like, hi, I'm Dan Austin. I want to teach music here. And he's like, oh, okay. And he's like, he, I, he'd never met me. He'd, you know, and I, I made sure I really pushed because I wanted this job. Um, and it, it worked out perfect. When I, when I landed here, um, the program was a little smaller, not really small like but there was one music teacher and I was teaching vocal instrumental and it was just all about okay I've got 10 years under my belt I know what I'm doing I have a chance to build my dream music program and that's sort of what I was able to do over the next 10 years you can see the brand new music room in behind me you know we've tripled in size we've added a bunch of programs um, and now I'm comfortable. Like, I don't think I'm leaving here. I've got about 10 years left. Um, they are opening a new school in Guelph and they were asking if I was interested and I, I'll help you set it up, but I think I'm comfortable here. So I, I don't think, I don't think there's any reason I would leave here. It was great at the early part of my career to do multiple jobs. Cause I really helped me refine and learn the skill. And I'm glad I taught at every level. And I'm glad I taught, like the school I taught in Toronto is what you would call inner city. Like it was a rough community. It was a, a, um, a very different setup than teaching, for example, here in Guelph. Um, so I'm glad I had all those experiences, but now that I've got the experience under my belt, I just wanna ride this out and enjoy teaching at a really successful music program. So that's sort of my feeling. I loved it, but at the same time, I'm happy where I am now. I don't think I'm going anywhere. Wow. That's great. So that actually kind of leads into my next question, which is like, what, what's it like now that you've done all that and knowing that you impacted that many people and that many like students in schools? It's actually, it's one of the best parts about being a music teacher is just being able to look back and see what your students are doing and see how many of them are still involved in music or even just what are they doing in life, right? Social media is great for that. Um, it was so funny. It's just yesterday, I got a message on Facebook from the sister of one of the students I taught at Glen Haven Middle School, which is like 15, 16 years ago. And she's like, you know, my sister's getting married and we're putting together a video tribute with some, you know, well wishes from people from her life. And we, you know, would you do it? I'm like, yes, of course. Like, that's the kind of stuff that you just love. Or you know, I look at some of my students now who are playing in community bands or symphonies, or even if they have like, it's playing acoustic guitar and they're posting videos and stuff that that's, that's what make this job great. Um, there's a few students that I've taught who are music teachers now, and I run into them at music conferences. Um, so it's cool just to see what everyone has done. It, it's the best part of this job. Like it, it, it's a unique experience that not a lot of people get where if a student takes music, instrumental music, I'm their teacher for four years, right? They don't have a different teacher every year. It's me. And I get to see them through all three or four of those years as they grow up, you know, and with a music program, you go on trips, you go, you do festivals, you do performances, you really get to know your students. And, you know, you, you, a lot of times I'll remain friends with them after I graduated and just, 
every now and then check in and say, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Um, so yeah, it's it's been super rewarding that way. And I, I, I'm i glad that I had the chance to work with so many incredible students over the last you know 20 years. Wow, that's great. Um, okay, well, moving to kind of some COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you run like band or extracurricular band during the pandemic in the last year? I did. Um, it was interesting. So what, <laughs> what we did, I mean, early on in this, I think a lot of music teachers were very frustrated, me, me included, where you're just like, what the heck am I going to do? Like, I'm being asked to run, to teach instrumental music without instruments. I'm being asked to, you know, somehow keep my numbers good because you know we live and die by option sheets when you're a, a music teacher you need kids taking your program but i can't run ensembles we can't do anything that we would normally do we can't even have kids in the room kids weren't allowed to come here lunch so i had a few moments where i was angry and annoyed by that and then a good friend of mine a guy named jordan travis who's a community choir director um made a good point we were talking and he's like look we all know what we can't do what can we do i'm like okay what can we do? And so we decided, well, you know, we can make these multi-track videos that everybody makes. How do I do that? And so we started to look into what do we do and how do we make that happen? And then we're like, well, we can run online rehearsals. What, what is that going to look like? So what we ended up doing is we ran all our ensembles and we ran online rehearsals. And it was myself and my two teaching partners last year. Now, the, 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 the woman who's taught music with me and has been our vocal and um, in, uh, guitar and music theater instructor was actually on a maternity leave this year. So we had two brand new teachers in, um, both great, but you know didn't know the kids and didn't know me. Um, but we ended up, the three of us would team teach and it was great. So on an online rehearsal, all the kids would log in from home. They'd play muted. We don't know if they were actually playing. I really hope they were. And we had recordings that we would, we would use. So we would use like warm up recordings and then we would use professional recordings of the actual songs we were working on and they would have them in their headphones and they'd be playing along. And I edited them to like rehearsal marks and all that and added count ins on the front. And we would just talk to them about things that they probably were doing wrong or needed help with. So here's some things to help with some rhythm. Maybe remember this about your tone let's pay attention to these dynamic markings, like all the things you would do in a normal rehearsal, just hoping that would be what would happen. And then the students would, would submit videos. Um, you know, there would be like videos that we would listen to and give the feedback. Now, not all the students did it, but some did. Uh, and it took a lot of hours. It took a ton of time just to go through those videos and give feed, feedback. And then eventually we had each of the students independently recording themselves listening to the recordings we didn't use click tracks we wanted them to still have the feeling of playing against the actual band so we used recordings that also allowed for like lyrical pieces that slowed down we had a couple pieces with some tempo changes in them um, and then all the videos were edited together we had professional video editing companies do it um, we were really lucky in one way so we were supposed to go to england in the spring of 2020 and we raised a lot of money for that through our marching band. We have a school marching band in Drumline. And when we do parades, we get paid. And we did a whole bunch of parades in the fall of 2019, planning to use that money to go to England. Of course, we didn't go to England. So last year, we had a lot of money that we could pay editors. So we had all our videos professionally put together for us. Um, and they ended up really cool. Um, in fact, we, we even made a CD of all the recordings. We did 23 um, recordings between um, the, the 18 months of the pandemic lockdown um, between all our different ensembles. And they were all done with the kids playing from their house, listening to recordings um, and editing them together. And it's not the most authentic way to learn um, the videos, you know, I've said this to people like, they're like, oh, well, how do they sound so good? Well, if a kid didn't play it right, we just muted them where they made mistakes. Like all of those things that you could do in a digital setting, you can't do right. in, in a real, real live setting. The other thing that we went with, and this was really cool, is we said, okay, what is the something we can only do in a digital setting? 
And we went, well, we can collaborate with people. We can collaborate with anybody. So we did a whole bunch of videos with professional musicians. We did two jazz recordings with professional musicians, a guy named Dan McCarthy, who's a professional vibe player, and um, uh, Phil Dwyer, who's like a, a Juno award-winning legendary saxophone player, lives up in BC, played with us. Um, our choir worked with a choir in Sweden. We worked with a professional Broadway actor from the production of Hamilton. Um, we did a huge collaborative project with McMaster University and five other high schools, including your alma mater, Blake Lock was in that. Um, and we also did one with all the Guelph high schools together in town. So because we were in a digital environment, we could do that. And that was actually really cool for the kids. Like, you know, doing, doing the, the choir piece with the guy from the Toronto production of Hamilton got us national media coverage. Um, and it was really cool. Uh, but as cool as all this was, and I've said this to many people, none of it compares to playing live. The kids want to play live, we want to play live, and we all want to play together. It was a cool year. I'm glad we had that experience. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Put it that way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Did you say you got 23 recordings in in 18 yep. months? Yep. Yeah. Uh, it was. Wow. A, I mean, it's, it's it's a lot, but then again, like we're talking about five ensembles, right? So each ensemble's doing you know, um, probably like four pieces, maybe five. And that's what we would do in a normal year anyways. So that's right. not like, you know, I, I wanted to keep it as close to what we would normally do as possible. The collaborative pieces made it more. Um, and we ended up, um, we ended up doing Music Fest, which we weren't sure we were going to do. And that, as a result, each group needed three recordings. So and we had some groups that didn't have enough without collaborators. So we had to throw a couple extras in at the end. Right. So. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, it's, it's not awesome, but it is awesome at the same time. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's so great. Like we have like a professional sounding, almost studio quality CD of these kids making this music, um, which is great. Cause you would, we wouldn't have done that in a normal year. We would never have even thought about putting the time together to do that in a regular year because you'd be so busy actually playing and putting together performances so that was cool but you know like i also had great students who came to me in september last year and said i'm not playing i just i i, I do band because i like hanging out with everybody i like coming to yeah. the music room and so there was that right it, it, the students want to play together they yeah. would rather have played together so. for sure wow well all right got a couple more questions for you here sure. um the next one is why is music education important to you? I, I think it's, it's so monumentally important to our students, but to me, I mean, it's why I fell in love with music. Um, and it's my music education experience is why I am who I am. And I had sort of, you know, a cathartic moment in my life. I was, um, I went to York University uh, in 1996, in the fall, in, in the, the early winter of 1997, the school went on strike for almost a year. Uh, it was a very, very bad strike. And I dropped out of school because I'm like, school's not running. And I moved to California and I started working on a cruise ship. And I had no intention of going back to school. I'm like, you know, I've got my dream. I'm going to become a professional musician. I am, you know, making a living playing music. This is great. And I got down there and I hated the job. I hated it. Like it just wasn't what I wanted. You know, the, the music wasn't that rewarding. The people weren't that rewarding. Um, and I went, man, I, this isn't fun anymore. <laughs> like what, what, right. why, why am I doing this? And I started to really think, and I said to myself, like, what is it about music that I love? What made it fun? And I'm like, it was my experience as a high school musician. It was the experience I had in school that made me fall in love with music. And that's when I went, you know what? I think I'm going to be a teacher. And I came back and I started my concurrent ed degree and got into teaching. And that's why I did it. Because for me, it was what made me the person I am. It's what I fell in love with in music was the education part of it, the learning of it. You know, the being in school where I wasn't have to, having to play music for a living. Um, and then the other thing we talked about it earlier is I just love to see my students fall in love with music, right? High schools where students figure out who they are. It's their like, find my people stage of your life. Like who, who, who are the important people? What do I wanna do? What do I wanna become? 
And to see them have music as part of that and just be like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to keep this in my life somehow. And a lot of them step away from it for a while. I mean, a lot of people, unless they study music at school, may not come back to it till like their 20s or 30s or whatnot, but it's always there. And even if they become the audience, right? They don't have to necessarily be the player, but they have a respect and understanding for the importance of music. That to me is what's so important. The skills you also learn in a music class, I think are so transferable to everything in life. Um, I think about like the discipline that you learn when you learn to play a piece of music at a very high level. And you're actually taking the time to not just play the notes and rhythms su successfully, but starting to like, how do I make music out of this? What is my role? How do I balance and blend? How do I phrase things? But you have to do that as a unit. You can't do it yourself. When you're in a band of 60, 70 students, you have to now learn, how do I navigate that, right? You have to deal with stuff like ego. You have to deal with stuff like um, how, how do I work with the person next to me? How do I help them? What are, what are the best ways to make this? And, you know, you start to, to develop those skills. Like I have a poster, it's right over there. It says, um, band is like a family, right? You have to learn how to negotiate and work together with everybody in that group. And that skill is so important. And although students do like group projects or being involved in athletics or drama or theater productions are very similar, it's not exactly the same because when you're in a band, you are creating music, all of you at the same time. There's never like the one star or like the role that's going to the big person and you're off stage for cut. Like you are on stage as a unit all the time creating one thing. And that skill is so massively important for life. So that to me is why music education is so important. It's that discipline, that skill, that sense of community that a group of students learn by learning music. Right, for sure. Yeah, the transferable skills thing, definitely. Yeah. That's what was ingrained into my head when I was in high school. <laughs> well, it's, it's true. I mean, as, as you and I talked about before we did this interview, I mean, going into music as a profession, it, it's, it's not an easy path these days and we don't know what it looks like. Yeah. But you, all the skills that you learn out of music, you know, can go into anything else. Like most of the students who graduate from my music program don't go into music. You know, I would say like, anywhere from like three to five a year might be about an average that go into music, but a lot of them go into other things like engineering, and medicine, and sciences, and humanities and whatever. And they still have got the experience and the skills they learned in band that go with them and it helps them in life. And I think that's a, that's a massively important part. Right. For sure. Well, all right. We got the next two here. Um, how do you balance being a performer, a teacher at a high school and a family man? <laughs> I don't very well. Um, <laughs> ask my wife. Uh, so it's hard. It's hard. Um, and I've had to really prioritize things. Um, and I, at the beginning, I wasn't as good at it. Like it was really hard to not want to do everything at the beginning. Um, and you know, I was, especially in my, my 20s, my, my, my early years of teaching, I was playing in a very successful independent R&B band in Toronto. Like we toured Canada. We did a lot of, um, we did a couple albums. We did a lot of shows. And that was hard to try to balance that. A couple of things helped me. Having children helped because I realized that I need to prioritize a little more. I need to be home a little more. Um, I need to find a balance of it. Um, and also the pandemic has been really good, which is, seems weird. Um, but I've talked to quite a few music teachers who I respect, who have said the same thing that this break was really good for us because I mean, music teachers in general and musicians, but like, we're all adrenaline junkies. We like the idea of the next thing, the performance, the, what, what's coming next. Always, you know, there's always another show. There's always something to work towards there wasn't any of that in the last 18 months. And it was weird. You know, like I sat around my house going like, what, what, what do I do? I, I don't know. And, you know, I started doing stuff like riding my bike more. I, I got in better shape. Um, I focused on 
other things in my life that I hadn't. And I was like, man, this is kind of great. I kind of like this. Um, so I, I'm still bad at saying no. <laughs> and I still have to work on the balance thing. It is definitely one of my biggest weaknesses that I, I always want to do, do stuff. Like I don't want to say no, I don't want to, to do that, but I've had to force myself to prioritize a little bit and say, okay, if I'm going to take on this role, something else has to go. Or if I'm going to do this performance, I might have to say no to these ones. And that's hard. It's hard. It's not ingrained in us as musicians. We always want to take the work. We always want to play. We always want the, the high of the performance, but, um, it's something I've had to, to learn and it's a constant battle. Let's put it that way. Um, but I think I'm getting a little better at it and the pandemic's been good. Having 18 months away from the normal pace has been really good. And it's made me even going into this year, there's some things that like normally I would be trying to book a whole bunch of things and do it. We're, we're not doing that. Like it's kind of dip our feet back in the water. Let's, let's, let's see how the first couple of rehearsals go. Let's see what we're allowed to do. Let's, I mean, if we only do one or two performances this year, that's okay, right? And in other years, I would have like, I would have had a dozen performances booked by now. So, you know, that's, it's a good thing. The, the pandemic has been good that way. Wow, that's very crazy. I, uh, that's definitely something I'm not quite ready for is being able to balance everything that I want to do you're young and trust me there's lots like i was exactly the same way at your age if i if i was offered to do something like you know it's like oh gig in london where i have to drive in the middle of the night and get there and get home at 3 a.m yeah i'm in count me in. <laughs> you know i would never say no to any of that stuff where now i go well i gotta get up in the morning i, I got the kids i gotta teach i don't want to be tired you know yeah. who's going to take care of the puppy like there's all of those kind of things that yeah. fall into place so Enjoy it while you're your age. It's fine. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And the last one is, what was it like being awarded the prestigious Beckwith Award? That was super cool um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I didn't know. I had no idea. Like normally when you win awards, you know that you're nominated. Like you'll find out that, oh, you're on a list and there's a possibility and, or like you kind of like, get an inkling through the grapevine that maybe you've been nominated for an award and stuff. I didn't even know, like they didn't tell us, which was super cool. It came from recommendations within the music industry. People who were like the award itself is given to music educators who do work with like Canadian composers, Canadian artists, do all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, I was nominated by a couple other music educators uh, some of the composers I worked with, that kind of thing. And that was cool because that, that means that people are paying attention and that it's a nice thing to know, right? Like I don't, I don't do this to win awards. I don't do this to, to get praise and accolades, but it's still nice every now and then to be told, Hey, you're doing a good job or to find out that people are paying attention to the work that you're doing. So that was the coolest part of that is that it just, um, it came through, like, I didn't know the award existed. I didn't know I was nominated. I didn't have any idea until an email just fell into my email box one day saying, congratulations, you've won this. Um, and it was actually uh, an award that goes to like different people in different areas. And I got to meet a really cool elementary music educator who I didn't know who, who won the elementary one. And now we've become friends and chatted online a few times. Um, the only thing that sucks is like, I have the award, it's actually hanging right above me, um, but they haven't presented it yet because COVID hit right after we, we won it. So I'm still looking forward to the day that they can actually come and do it because I've only ever spoken to the people from the Canadian Music Center online. I haven't met them yet. So wow. I'm looking forward to once things are reopened and we're back to normal, and hey, who knows when that's going to be, um, I can actually you know, meet them, thank them in person, because it was very cool. It's, it's meaningful to get recognized by your peers. So yeah, for sure. Well, congratulations. Thanks. That's awesome. Um, all right, Dan. Well, I think we're, I think we're done. That's all of them. So awesome. thank you so much for, for coming in today. Well, I appreciate you guys having me and I hope uh, 
whoever listens to this got something out of it. You know, reach out anytime on social media if anybody wants to chat or wants to know anything. Um, I'm more than willing to chat about music. So, yeah, for sure. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, you can learn more about our organization at bandology.ca, which features information about music education, advocacy, and research, and our play gig and band camp programs. Follow us on social media for more videos, performances, and interviews on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you soon.